Okay, so we are going to begin chapter 14 today. And chapter 14 is on gene expression. So going from our DNA or our genes all the way to making a protein. And the protein is how we're going to bring about some action inside of our cell um, or our bodies. So our goal here for this chapter, guys, is to get from DNA to RNA, and then overall to a protein, okay? So we're gonna go through that whole uh, spiel of things right there. Sorry if you heard the bell there. Okay, so in our genes, guys, our genes are made up of DNA, and we already, you already talked about that in a previous chapter. Um, with that DNA, the DNA is going to house the instructions in order to make an amino acid. And if you remember what an amino acid was, an amino acid is the monomer of proteins. And when we put two amino acids together, we get a dipeptide. And more than that, we get a polypeptide. So when we get a polypeptide that is big enough, we are going to make a protein. Now, these proteins are going to give us uh, our link between our genotype and our phenotype. In other words, that's going to be for the genotype is our alleles. The phenotype is how those alleles are seen from us. And that's where the proteins are uh, going to come into play. So for gene expression, we are going to go over two different stages. The first one is going to be transcription. And the second one is going to be translation. So we're going to start off with uh, transcription first, guys. Before we get to that, um, here is our, like I said, it's a relationship between genotype and phenotype. So in this first one here, we have two different phenotypes for these, these deer. We have the regular phenotype, which is seen here on the left, and then we have our other phenotype, which is gonna be the albino one uh, on the right there. So a while ago, um, crazy, it's, you know, um, 19th century, or 1900 seems, you know, so long ago now, um, you know, since we're in, what, 2021 now. But anyway, so all of this stuff right here, um, these early experiments, this was way before, as we went over last chapter, all these different experiments with DNA. This was before um, those experiments were occurred. So they didn't know too much about DNA, and the DNA was all the uh, hereditary material. But anyway, so in 1902, um, British physician Garrod first suggested that genes dictate phenotypes through enzymes. So if you remember what enzymes are, enzymes are a specific, specific type of protein. And if you remember enzymes, we talked about them, uh, I think in chapter three, where enzymes can be used to lower the activation energy that, an ener uh, that a reaction needs to take place. So what they do, guys, is you require, you know, we'll just say 10 joules of energy for a reaction to take place. If the enzyme is present, it might take that down to one joule or two joules. So in other words, we're just lowering that amount of energy so that we have energy for other uh, functions that we're, we, we need to, you know, happen in our body. So anyway, uh, he thought the symptoms of an inherited disease reflect an inability to synthesize a certain enzyme. So he was thinking that when you have a disease, you're just not making that particular enzyme that uh, helps people be free of that disease, all right? So after this, uh, Beetle and Tatum, they disabled genes in bread mold. Okay, why, why the heck would they use bread mold? We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, and they were trying to find phenotypic changes in that, that bread mold. So bread mold is actually a haploid uh, cell. It's not diploid like us. So since it's haploid, it only has one of each chromosome. So if it only has one of each chromosome, that means for any particular trait, it's only gonna have one allele. Let me repeat that again. If it's haploid, it only has one chromosome, you know, of each of them. It doesn't have two, like our cells do, like our diploid cells. So what's gonna happen is it's only going to have one allele, because it only has one chromosome, for any particular trait. 
So what this means, guys, is if it's haploid, um, we are only going to have a dominant allele and a recessive allele, which will lead to the dominant phenotype and the recessive phenotype, and that's it. Um, we're not going to have a heterozygous individual. We're actually not going to have a homozygous dominant or a homozygous recessive either. It's just either going to be dominant or recessive, and that's it. Um, so we don't have to worry about that one allele being masked. And this is common for uh, fungi like bread mold and also algae. I'll post the video, guys. Um, there's a few videos in this one. Uh, there's one on transcription. I want to make sure you guys watch, but it's it'll be better for you guys to just watch the direct one. So what they found out, guys, is that if we go back to the previous experiment in 1902, they were talking about enzymes. Well, some proteins aren't enzymes. And the previous one, it was like for one gene, we're going to have one enzyme. Now, um, beetle and tatum changed it, so they're like, okay, well, not all of our uh, not all of our proteins are enzymes. So what they found was that they did this hypothesis of one gene is going to be for one protein. But then they went a little further into it and they were, well, proteins are polypeptides, uh, so we can actually kind of even get more specific with it and say, all right, one gene is going to be influenced by one polypeptide. So now we're going to go over transcription and a little bit of translation, just an overview, guys. So for uh, transcription, this is going to be our first step of gene expression. For transcription, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be taking our DNA and we're going to be transcribing it through transcription into mRNA. Now I'm going to talk about eukaryotic cells first. For eukaryotic cells, our cells, plant cells, animal cells, okay, all these types, um, our DNA is located in the nucleus, just like all eukaryotic cells. Our DNA is protected inside of that nucleus, so we do not want our DNA to leave the nucleus. So our DNA is going to stay inside the nucleus. That's its home. It doesn't want to leave its home. It's always going to stay there, okay? So transcription is going to be the process of DNA changing into mRNA. Now, we still have our DNA. It's just making uh, mRNA out of the DNA's message. But based on what I just said, this transcription is going to happen in the nucleus because we don't want our DNA to get hurt. We don't want it leaving the nucleus. It has a nice, safe home in the nucleus, okay? So RNA is going to be our first character that we are going to try to get to. Now, RNA, it's very, very, very similar to DNA. Um, few differences. Instead of thymine, thymine is in DNA, RNA is going to have uracil, okay? Um, so if you remember, we went over last chapter the purines and the pyrimidines, and I said how to remember this is uh, pure agony, purines, uh, agony begins with AG. So the purines are adenine and guanine. Now, thymine was not part of that. Thymine was part of the pyrimidines. So... We're replacing thymine with uracil. So in our RNA, uracil is still going to be a pyrimidine, just like thymine is for DNA. Uh, RNA is usually single-stranded. There are going to be some instances where you go over double-stranded RNA later on, but most of it is single-stranded. So we were talking about this, guys. Uh, transcription, this is going from DNA to RNA. Now, our specific RNA, because there's a lot of different RNAs out there, the specific RNA that we're going to for transcription is going to be mRNA, and that's messenger RNA. Think of it this way, guys. We have DNA. DNA can, carries all of the instructions uh, for making a protein. What we're going to do is we are going to make it into a messenger. So we're going to take that DNA, the message from it, and give it to the messenger, pretty much. And that's messenger RNA or mRNA. And what that mRNA is going to do is going to carry the message or carry the instructions from DNA to outside of the nucleus so that we can go to a ribosome and make a protein. Because if you remember from chapter four, I believe it was, we talked about ribosomes. Uh, they're both on the rough ER and free floating throughout the cell. And those ribosomes are going to make 
our proteins. So that's where the second stage is going to happen. All right. So translation is our second stage. And we are going to take our mRNA now that we made in transcription, and we are going to take it over into a protein. All right. So I'll write it on this one. So we're going to start with DNA. And we are going to go to first mRNA. And then we are going to go to our protein. So this process right here, uh, DNA going to mRNA, that is transcription. And then the mRNA going to the protein, that is translation. Transcription is going to occur in the nucleus. This is for eukaryotic cells only, obviously, because prokaryotic cells are not going to have a nucleus. And translation is going to occur on a ribosome, whether it is a free ribosome or one on the rough ER. Okay? So there is a nice little flow chart for you guys to show the processes, what they're turning into, and where they occur. All right. Um, now, I've been going over this nucleus, the DNA going into mRNA, and the DNA is not going to leave that nucleus, and that's for eukaryotes. Okay. Now, if we're turning our DNA into mRNA in the nucleus, our mRNA is going to have to wait till it's done being made to leave the nucleus and go to the ribosome. Again, that's for eukaryotes. Our mRNA has to wait until it's done being made to leave the nucleus and go to the ribosome. Now for prokaryotes, they don't have a nucleus. So as the mRNA is being made, what can happen is if we have the first little bit of mRNA being made, it can go right over to the ribosome. And while it's still being made at the end of it, that front part of mRNA can already start to be translated into amino acids, into a protein. Okay, so for prokaryotes, transcription and transla translation can happen simultaneously. For eukaryotes, transcription is going to happen first, it's going to go to completion, and then we are going to start translation. So that's our, a little bit of a difference, and that's all because of the nucleus. So here is our DNA going to mRNA in the nucleus. This is again for eukaryotic cells. And then we are going to leave the nucleus. We are going to go onto a ribosome. And while we are on that ribosome, we are going to make our amino acids. And those amino acids are going to be connected together to make a polypeptide chain, which once that polypeptide grows uh, big enough, it's going to turn into a uh, protein. All right. Okay, so we are going to have an initial uh, RNA transcript from one gene prior to processing. This is called the central dogma. And this was first proposed by uh, Francis Crick, who was, if you guys remember from last chapter, one of the people who contributed to finding the structure of DNA. Uh, Francis Crick is the one that uh, is no longer with us. But anyway, um, the central dogma uh, is the concept that cells are governed by a cellular chain in command. So in other words, guys, we are going to have our DNA, our RNA, and then our protein. So it's kind of like DNA controls every single part of our cell and then it's going to make the RNA, which is then going to make the protein, and then the protein is going to do whatever action it is, but everything goes back to DNA because DNA gave those instructions to make the RNA, to make the protein, for the protein to do that final function. Now, DNA and 
RNA, they are going to work on these triplet codes. And in order to make an amino acid, we are going to need three nucleotides, whether it's a DNA nucleotide or an mRNA nucleotide, we need three nucleotides to be able to uh, translate the code for one amino acid. So three nucleotides equals an amino acid. So if you guys see here, we are going to have our mRNA, so we got our DNA up here, um, and I'm actually going to label something on this DNA. So on our DNA, if you look here, we have this strand, in red, and then I'm going to make the other one in black. Okay. So down here we have our mRNA. Now as we're going to go through these, we have an A, I'm just going to do the black strand. We have an A, a C, a C, A, A, a okay, you guys get it. Down on the red strand, we start off with a T, G, G, T, 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 okay. Look what's down here on our mRNA. We begin with a U. Look above. We have a T on one strand of our DNA. We have an A on the other strand of our DNA. Now, which one of them is going to bond to the U? Is it going to be the T or is it going to be the A? Well, if you remember for DNA-based pairing roles, A goes to T, G goes to C. Apple in the tree, car in the garage. Now, when we go to mRNA, the A no longer goes to the T because there is no T in mRNA. A is going to go to U. So just keep in mind, guys, the black strand is up top. The red strand is down below for our DNA. I'm going to erase it real quick. The A is going to go to the U. So we are using this black strand here to make our mRNA. This strand is made to make our uh, mRNA. If we were using this strand here, the second strand, okay, or our red strand, our mRNA would look like this. T would go to A, G would go to C, C, A. Okay, our mRNA would look like that. In other words, it would look like our black strand up there. Okay, so given that we used our top strand, to make our mRNA. That strand that we used is called the template DNA. The other strand, or our red strand that we had, the one that we are not using to make our mRNA, this is called our coding strand of DNA. So we have a template strand and we have a coding strand of DNA. Now, if we are given the coding strand, and I'm just gonna, I'm gonna add a slide in here real quick, guys. Let's say hypothetically you're given a coding strand of DNA. So your coding strand Let's say it's A, T, T, G, C, A. And let's say the problem asks you to get to mRNA. Well, what you have to do first is take your coding strand because that is not the strand we use. We use the opposite strand. We first have to go to the template strand. And again, this is still DNA. So A would go to T, A, A. C, G, and A would go to T. Now, after that, we can take our template strand and go to mRNA, where T would go to A, A would go to U, U, G, C, A. And if you look here, what we could say is our coding strand and our mRNA are pretty much the same strand except for if we have any T's there, we make them into U's and that's it. 
All right. So that is that part, guys. And here's the template strand that we just talked about. All right. Um, again, the template strand is the one we're going to use to get to the mRNA, but we can use the coding strand to get to the mRNA. We just have an extra step in there. Okay. All right. Um, let's call it a day here, guys, before we get too far into codons, and uh, we will pick it up here next time. Have a good rest of your day, guys.